much that needs to grow today. Rain, rain, please don't go away. I love H2. Welcome to the Master Rain Gardener Certification class. This is where we teach you to design your own rain garden. By the end of our five-part series, you'll have your own rain garden all planned out for your very own yard. This is Susan Bryan. I'm with Washtenaw County Water Resources, and I'm here with Shannon Gibrandall, Principal of Insight Design Studio here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Welcome, Shannon. Hi. Also today, uh, we're featuring Katie Wajicek, our water quality specialist, who will be talking about volunteer opportunities, and Pat Gomez-Martz, our Master Rain Gardener alum and I will be telling the story of her rain garden. So welcome everyone. Okay, so this is a five part series and this is part three. So there's two more left. Um, today we will really be digging into digging your rain garden, how to get the labor done, how to get that plan on paper, all of the, the um, this is an action packed episode really. And next week we'll be talking about plants, planting design, and then the last class will be workshopping your designs. So we're giving you feedback. Every class will have plants of the day and alumni will tell the story of their own rain gardens. Okay, so um, if we're going to get muddy this class, and so did Eric Jensen's grandson when he helped build his rain garden. Isn't this cute? And he's got um, a real shovel. Only Eric is a master gardener as well, and of course master gardeners give their grandchildren real tools. That's a real shovel and he's helping it. Also, I love how you can really see in this photo the rain garden that's not too deep and it's um, sh shallow and level. It's a nice, nice photo. There's that garden, same garden, all finished, Eric and his wife celebrating. And then this is just this past year, how it's grown up and started to look really, really beautiful. Okay, with that introduction, uh, today we're going to talk about, we're going to review a little bit about those rules that we talked about last week about where to put a rain garden and have some site, um, some case studies. Uh, Shannon is going to talk about digging and soils. Katie will be in to talk about becoming a rain garden steward and volunteer opportunities. Pat gomez Martz will talk about her story of a rain garden and will measure your yard, get your plan on paper. Plants of the week will focus on part shade, part sun, part shade, and then we'll talk about homework. So what was that Hippocratic Oath of the Master Rain Gardener? First, do no harm because we're trying to solve problems here, not make them. So if you missed last week's class on the rules of where to put a rain garden, go back to class number two because those are very important rules. Um, those, so go back and review. But if you have already seen them, let's just sort of review a little bit. So for instance, here's an example. Um, these folks came to me and were interested in putting in a rain garden right where that red arrow is pointing. And the reason why is because the water from their downspout flowed down that slope in their front yard all the way to the sidewalk and then would create a puddle and that puddle would turn to ice. So that's why they were interested. Here's a question. Would you put a rain garden in this spot? Hmm. Well, Shannon, any? <laughs> <laughs> I think you used to call this a slam dunk. This one is a slam yeah, dunk. This is, this is a pretty easy one. No sidewalk in the way, you know. The, yeah. the only thing that's a little tricky is what is that pile back in the upper left? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there used to be a tree there. So you might hit some some roots, right. but very observant. Yeah, very observant. Um, Actually, their uh, mother, uh, Jenny's mom, Beth Kane, came to visit and dug their rain garden, which is lovely, you know, beautiful gift for a couple with a new baby, actually. And there it is all dug, mulched, and composted. And you can see how it's shaped, how it's going to catch that water before it overflows onto the sidewalk. And then the next year I took a picture, and there it is growing up and looking beautiful. So they put up a little sign that says, rain garden, it's solving their ice problem, and then I happen to see next door, this is their next door neighbor. Do you think perhaps Edie is a gardener? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> so Edie easy, gave... easy conversion going on here, right? Right. Easy potential <laughs> conversion. That's right. Um, so she had, Edie had me out, their next door neighbor, and we, um, she was interested in capturing the water from her driveway, which is, as we re will recall, a little trickier. So we stood up near that garage and we let a hose run down, you know, we had the hose running and we ran that water down the driveway and we saw where did it go. And it went down and then it went 
to the side, which is mm -hmm. good, away from her house. That's the way it should be. And it went right in where that arrow is pointing. So that's where she put a little trench, and she directed that water into a rain garden that uh, was parallel to her driveway. And you can see, this is an after photo. This is, you know, the garden is already there. You can see the wild strawberries and the uh, blue flag iris are just looking fantastic, loving life. So I love how Jenny and Harak's work putting in a beautiful rain garden really um, uh, spread it to her neighbors, and her neighbors were inspired um, by uh, their garden. Okay, so here's uh, example number two. Would you put a rain garden here? And I just want to point out that right now the ground slopes gently towards that garage. The garage does not have a basement, but it had like a bunch of squishy grass right where you can see the trash can. So squishy grass means there's, you know, that's not good to be so close to the house. And it, the slope is towards the house, so that's a problem. So what do you think, Shannon? Would this be a good place? It's a tricky spot because, you know, photographs flatten things out, but you can see that there is a slope there. And mm -hmm. um, you can also see, if you look really carefully, that the photo, there's sort of a dark green, darker green area in the lawn where you can see that water is likely ponding, where that mm -hmm. water is sitting. So it may not be actually hitting the wall of the, of the garage so much, but, you know, there's like a slight little depression out there, but no good to have that water sitting there. So, um, right. yeah, you can you can build a rain garden out there, but it's going to be a lot of digging if you've got to if you're going uphill. That's right. There. You're you're so, digging uphill. So, hire your teenagers now. That's right. <laughs> um, and since they have a problem by putting in this rain garden and moving the low spot away from the building so that it's farther away in the yard, they've solved that. Um, right. squishy grass problem and they won't have be damaging their house by having water next to their house. Also it means when they walk back and forth to their trash cans into their backyard they won't be walking through squishy grass so that's nice. It solves all of that but there's right. a lot of dirt moving. So yes and oh and then I have another photo of uh, it all grown up and looking beautiful. So it's really solved their problem and made a beautiful little spot. I think that's blue lobelia growing mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. and some um, and here it really made sense to use a pipe because yeah. they wanted to walk over that spot. You know, that's a pathway for them. So right. with the pipe, it meant even more digging. So in other words, they uh, they really, they did a, a serious digging project here. But look at it. It looks great and it's functioning. So, Yeah, yeah. And that's a river birch in the background that's mm -hmm. in the rain garden. And yep. river birches love rain gardens. Yes, perfectly happy there. Okay. This is our last example, example number three. Would you put a rain garden here? And this is an entirely different kind of situation. So this is at Pioneer High School. It's the Rec and Ed office. So it's an office, and in front of that, there's a small parking lot, and that whole parking lot drained to this mud pit in their front <laughs> lawn. <laughs> so the water's already getting there. It's already creating mud. Um, it's not too, the water's not too deep. It's like, you can see it's, it's, um, yeah. uh, not you know a foot of water it's more like three inches and um, so and there's something growing in there it's not like it's a desert but <laughs> would, you, what, would you put a rain garden here what are some of the issues that you might think about before jumping off um, into that into the idea of, that you can put a rain garden here and, and so, I noticed Katie's also joined us and so she, <laughs> You might have something to say about this as well. <laughs> so this rain garden is in front of a public building, um, so it's maintained just by volunteers. So I think it's a great spot for a rain garden. It's definitely capturing a lot of water, but um, when it was built, it was built really big because they had such a big water issue, and now it is difficult to maintain. So you also have to think about how big of a garden are you willing to be weeding out every year. That's right. Um, you can see the years of volunteer rain garden maintenance events that we've held at uh, this rain garden. And also, it's gotten a lot better lately because one of the staff people there, Seema Jolly, and one of our master rain gardeners, Leslie Kelman, have really worked hard to um, put some more work into this rain garden. So, you know, planting it is like step one. 
Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, the years go by and you need to keep yeah. eating. So especially in your own garden, that just happens sort of naturally, especially if you walk by it every day. But in a public rain garden, it's a lot more effort. So keep that in mind. It's a, it's a relationship. It's not just like a date, you know. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, we're certainly going to use that more later. Also, um, and uh, Katie works with a lot of these folks too. If you're working with a school, there's some other resources that you can avail yourself of. And one is the SEMIs, which are a teach. It's a teacher group of teachers that do continuing education in the summertime. And Katie's been working with them to train teachers in rain gardens so that you'd have an ally within your school. Um, also, there's this green school program that a lot of schools participate in, and they would get credit for putting in a rain garden. And the National Wildlife Federation has a schoolyard program as well. So those are some resources that you could avail yourself of. But you know, look at that picture to the left. That is a parent, and she's watering in the middle right. of summer when there's no school. So you have to right. rally those resources. And that's a parent whose kid eventually grows out of the school, too. So that's, that's the right. other tricky thing about the school is those kids just keep getting older, you know, and so it's right. hard you can't get them to keep coming back. But you did get them for a while. I did it at my school, and I certainly had kind of a generation of kids that had put it in and knew it and were familiar with it, but then you really have to work to kind of keep it, keep the enthusiasm level going for the kids that didn't put it in. So that's, I think, one of the sort of unique things about schools is how to build that enthusiasm after the fact. Right. Also, on the plus side, it meant that you could pass it on to someone else, and then, you know, your kid left, and so you're right. out of there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect excuse. <Yeah. laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, okay, so now for the action-packed moment of the class, we're going to talk about digging and soils and how to make all that happen. Shannon, what are some things to think about as you plan? Okay, so your body. That's what you want to think about. <laughs> How are you going to really pull this thing off? <laughs> so, and if you can, sometimes you're forced into absolutely digging a hole and there's no a chance to kind of cut and fill and things like that. Um, but be, like in this situation here in the upper right, she had to go underneath the sidewalk and so there was just no getting around the fact that she just had to dig a lot. Um, and some people use that um, extra soil for a berm or spread it in other places in the yard, but if you, if you can achieve the balance between cut and fill, that's what you really want. Um, so, but I'll take you through some examples of how to dig this thing. So here is the, you know, the proverbial slope here on the left hand side and you can see in, in an ideal world, and this is grade, the, the topography there is a little exaggerated, you can see um, uh, that's actually kind of a steep, steeper slope, but you see how there's kind of cutting on that left side and then there's filling on that right side and in a perfect world everything just like evens out, right? You don't have any extra stuff at the end. Um, so a little bit of cut, a little bit of fill, but if you're doing it on a slope you have to think about the orientation of the rain garden. This is really hard to get your head around and the best way to be able to um, see it in kind of an exaggerated form is to travel around the world and look at Asia where they have these rice paddy style you know farming practices and you know these have been going on for millennia right so you know that they weren't using a bobcat to make these things happen um, so they were very aware of cut and fill I'm sure because they didn't want to just you know truck all that soil somewhere else so a little bit of cut a little bit of fill to be able to make those terraces and again we're not encouraging people to put them on steep hills but you can see the idea of kind of creating these platforms and um, for the water to be flat and infiltrate down so right, that's the water pond's flat, right? But water does not lie. It's always going to be right. flat. It's so very to honest. Right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so be inspired by the rice paddy idea and this whole kind of idea of cut and fill and stepping down. And again, your, your slope is probably not that steep, but think about it in that way in terms of you do probably have some slope. Um, and so to think about that way in terms of digging. That's right. That you want that sweet spot. So the other thing is that, you know, you saw those rice paddies, they looked so flat, so perfectly flat. So there are a couple of different tools to help you achieve that level um, goal. One is called the line level and that is used at, at that graphic up in the upper left hand corner if you 
put two stakes in the ground and you um, put a string up and then you have this little line level it costs like a buck fifty at the hardware store and you kind of scoot that string around until you get that thing perfectly level then you can measure down from that to the bottom of your rain garden where you've been digging to see you know it, whatever it is you just want it to be a consistent measurement it could be 12 inches it could be 14 inches it could be 5 inches you just want it to be the same all the way across and you may have noticed um, uh, last week when Roger Moon was um, speaking he did it with a 2 by 4 and a regular old level so you can do it that way too um, but here's an, another uh, method the other thing is that rain really helps because if you dig and it rains then you can go out there with a the tape measure and figure out you know how if, how good you've been too um, there's nothing like a real rain or just sticking your hose on it and see um, and then you can measure uh, to see how consistently deep that water is all the way across. So um, the depth, how deep you want this to be. So this is something that is uh, debated a lot <laughs> and there probably how is deep, no magic answer uh, for this. Um, how deep the water is. Yeah. How deep the water is, right? Not how deep the digging is. Well, it relates, right? You know, in the end, there's a lot more digging than, than the depth of your rain garden at the very end and we'll go through that kind of step by step. But you generally, if you had really heavy clay soils and it took a long, long time for things to infiltrate, like over 24 hours or even over 18 hours, you want that rain garden to be pretty shallow, so three inches, because w water sitting around on plants, like six inches of water sitting around on plants for clay that's holding it for a long time is not a great place for plants, actually. So if you're in sandy soils, that's no problem at all. You may even be able to go deeper if you have super sandy soils. But with those clay soils, that's going to um, hold that water for a lot longer, so you want those uh, to be shallower. So soil type relates a lot to this, and we're going to go into that a little later. But first, I'm going to go through kind of the steps of digging. So this is a version with a pipe because this is the most digging. So I want to kind of show you the worst case scenario. So the first stage is dig to the bottom of the pipe. Okay, so you can see that dashed um, yellow line and you want that to be flat, right? So generally flat. Now the stuff that you've dug up is hopefully good topsoil, right? So don't just pitch it everything all in one pile. What you want to do is reuse that topsoil. So get a tarp or a black plastic bag or something like that and stick it on top of that. Save that nice dark brown stuff. And you know, since um, it all starts with the bottom of the pipe, as you're laying that pipe, you know, one step previous, you want to keep it as shallow as possible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to save your digging. back a little yeah. bit. More digging. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So you've gotten to the bottom of the pipe. Now we're going to take stage number two, and that is to the rain garden depth. Let's say it's six inches in this case. They had reasonably draining soils. So this could be topsoil. Um, depending on what your soils look like. And so if it still looks nice and dark brown, and we'll show you some pictures of what that may look like, save it again. Stick more of it on that tarp. If it's looking like, eh, not so great, then pitch it in a different pile, um, and we can use that for your berm. Now, you think you're done, right? But you're not. <laughs> so here's the next yeah. phase of digging. <laughs> so now, you you in the previous slide you got to the bottom of your anger but now you want to make that soil really nice for your plants because you know they're going to be doing some work and you need to give them a decent place to live and if they're you know trying to grow in a bunch of subsoil it doesn't have any good topsoil organic stuff in it not very fair way to start out life um, so you want to dig again at this point you're likely into the subsoil it's likely much lighter in color you can use that for your berm you can use that stuff um, so uh, pitch it somewhere else don't let it be the thing that you're going to put your your plants in and you can line that whole um, uh, rain garden with that okay now we got to put the good stuff back in so you've got your topsoil now if it's super dark brown and looks fabulous you may not have to add compost but if it looks a little meager you know not very dark brown then you may want to add compost and there's no kind of magic amount um, we've seen in places where people have just really awful super light colored soils or pure sand or something like that we've seen even a 50 50 mix um, or you could just add 10 percent or 20 percent or something like that just to give it a little bit of a boost um, all those good nutrients in there and it um, if you have clay soils it's really the only way to basically give your um, soil some levity so uh, um, clay is greatly improved by compost actually so if you have heavy clay compost is a good thing to be able to add to that so now you're mixing that compost 
or just your great topsoil that you've dug up and you're putting it back in and then you can't just leave it fluffy you've got to foot compact it now um, if Pigpen knew what he was doing he'd actually move around the whole rain garden and not just do it in that one spot but you want it to be kind of somewhat settled down um, another way to do that sometimes is uh, rain will do that to a certain extent too but you need to do a little foot compacting and then you can do that kind of fine-tuning leveling thing uh, after you've uh, foot compacted it and you kind of go back and forth with that a little bit alrighty so now you can put your mulch on a couple of inches the mulch does not count towards your um, towards your depth because it'll find its way down in there we usually do about two inches some people like to add mulch after they plant some people do it before that's kind of your your call I'd say more people end up putting it in before because it's easier to spread that way alrighty and then after you do your mulch you can plant Yay, you got there. So uh, that's the digging process um, if you've got a pipe. Um, so if you, there are other methods you can use um, if you are not using a pipe. So ways to be able to prevent, like to minimize your digging a little bit is to uh, have a swale because you don't have to get to that bottom of the pipe in the first place, right? So there's less digging involved. The other thing you could do is have a pop-up, which we showed you last time, where it literally kind of bends up um, and, it, and it bleeds out that top. So that's basically the same kind of condition as digging as if it were a swale. And then this is something that occasionally people do in situations where um, it's a steeper slope. It's really difficult to be able to get um, you have like a bunch of tree roots or it's difficult to be able to dig. Some people have actually made a little series of berms. Um, think of them as like corduroy where you have like little lines that are kind of stopping you know, up the water as it goes down a hill. Um, that's in pretty unusual circumstances where you can be able to pull that off. But um, if, especially in situations where you feel like you're going to kill a bunch of trees but you really want to deal with your water, that's a way to be able to handle it if you've got the right kind of trees. That's right. Um, you know, a couple people have asked me too. Um, I just visited someone yesterday who she was so relieved when I told her she didn't have to dig at all. And that's a situation when you, your water's already ponding. It's about three inches deep. Mm -hmm. It's not near your house. It's a place where you wouldn't mind having a garden bed. You don't have to dig. You're scot free. You're good. Just plant it. Um, or if, if you've got a bunch of lawn there, you need to get rid of the lawn. Right, just uh, get rid of the lawn yeah. and done. Um, yeah. So it, not everyone has to dig. If you already have some nice ponding water, you can just plant it. So keep that in mind too. Right, and that's something that you're going to see on the internet. People will say, don't put a rain garden in a place where you already have ponding water. And we say, go ahead and put a rain garden in a place where you already have ponding water because lawn does nothing for that because its roots are so shallow and by planting the right plants you may not completely alleviate the ponding but you will reduce it a whole lot because um, you're putting in the kind of plants that are going to break up those soils and absorb things more. That's right. Alrighty, so a little bit on soils. So most of us aren't digging up our ground this deep, so it's kind of interesting to be able to see what they call these soil horizons. These are these horizontal levels of different soil types. This you can see that that nice dark brown topsoil at the top, and then as it goes down, it lightens. Um, that's where you're getting into that subsoil. It doesn't have as many organics in it. So uh, this is pretty heavy clay, you can tell, because it's straight up and down. <laughs> now, yeah. if, you have, if you have soil like this when you're digging, then you're good, man. You, you don't need any compost. You're totally great, um, because that stuff is beautiful. But not all of us have that. <laughs> not many of us have that, actually. <laughs> only, right. only very few of the lucky ones. Really, what we're trying to get an understanding of is the difference between whether you have sandy soil or clay soil. Sandy soil, the particles are much bigger, and so the water will go right through them. Clay soil, the particles are itty-bitty, teeny-tiny, and they stick together, and so the water takes a lot longer to be able to go down. So if you have clay soil, and it's moist, you can take some and make what they call a ribbon out of it. You can see uh, that person right there with their thumb making a ribbon. Um, sandy soil will not do that. It'll just kind of fall through your hands. Now if your clay soil is dry, you're never going to be able to <laughs> make a ribbon. You kind of have to do that in the spring when it's wet. Um, but you can also see that kind of bluish gray clay soil down below. That's where the particles are just the tiniest. And that basically means that there's um, 
there's no oxygen in it. It's just like your blood. It shows up blue when there's no oxygen in it like that. And that soil would drain the slowest out of all the clays, out of any soil, frankly. So right. if you hit right. blue clay, you, you know, that's a challenge. So compost. Compost is fabulous stuff. You can do it from your own food scraps. Um, uh, you can get it from municipal sources too, especially if it's a big facility. Those weed seeds will be baked right out of it. And then it just helps grow wonderful plants. So compost is fabulous when you can mix it in uh, with plants. That's right. Mix and it in with topsoil. Sorry. Yeah. Right, mix it with the topsoil. Um, and uh, it can be from plant material mm -hmm. like this. It can also be from um, animal waste, which, you know, it sounds gross, but actually it works really well. And this is the sort of elixir of life. It's a circle of life, you know, That's right. things That's right. die and then they, you know, give life to new new plants. So um, Susan grew up in a, in a vegetable gardening family and she was illuminating me earlier about <laughs> different kinds of um, the animal types <laughs> they produce That's and true. which ones are the best. So I think you should share that because I thought that was interesting. Okay, uh, well this is what my parents found over many years of gardening and that is uh, that bunny manure and all this manure must be composted so it has to be in a pile to age for a year or two and um, so bunny manure that's been aged and um, pigeon manure are the best they're fantastic there's no weeds in there um, and then next best is cow that's been composted and then the worst is horse because there's tons of weed seeds in there uh, but if it comes from maybe a municipal source uh, it won't be as um, all those compost, all those seeds will get baked out because the compost actually gets really hot, so you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, so that's the, the, the that's the best and the worst of uh, animal compost. But yeah, you, from your garden, you'll have you know some maybe some tomato seeds in there. Sure, right, like exactly, right. Yeah. Um, but both sand and clay soils benefit from compost. It's one of those sort of magical things that. Uh, uh, will benefit any kind of soil. And oh, someone asked me a question yesterday. Ruth Hart was asking, does compost help the water soak in? And it does. There's an immediate yeah. effect that you'll get a better infiltration once you add compost. And then the, then the plants take over as they get bigger. Okay, so what was your in percolation rate? The time to beat, <laughs> the fastest time was 13 minutes, 8 seconds. Angela Hill. <laughs> yeah. That's fast. It's less than an hour. Um, and then the longest on the other end of the spectrum was Della Dyer. After three days, there's still water sitting at the bottom <sighs> of the bowl. This, she, she took the class last year, actually, and um, her garden, she planted a rain garden there, and it turned out fine. Beautiful rain garden. It just, just has to be a little bit more shallow, and it will still work out. Okay, so remember that our rule of thumb was that the rain garden size is about 20% of the roof area. But now that you have your percolation test results, we just want to like tweak that a little bit. And that is if your percolation rate is less than 18 hours, then your rain garden should be 20% of your roof area. But if your percolation rate is more than 18 hours, you should consider making your rain garden 30% of the roof area, if you have enough room for that, and only three inches deep. And the only three inches deep is probably the only hard and fast rule. The bigger is only if you want to make it bigger because sometimes you don't have enough space like just do what you can do you know maybe you just that's as much as you're gonna get and a three inch rain garden that's small is still gonna do good yep every little bit helps that's right okay so now we, we're gonna see what kind of questions have popped up um, Katie what what are some questions that uh, people have chatted in all right, so what if my site doesn't have any good topsoil on the top, so I have to amend the rain garden completely? Should I be using compost or topsoil or peat, and what exactly is the difference between them all? Uh, good question. Um, you can. It's actually best to use the soils that you have and mix them with compost. Um, you know, you can buy topsoil, that's all good, but um, Topsoil has a mineral content too, and it's often kind of sandy. And if it's really different than the mineral content of your soil, sometimes things don't play so well together. So it's best if you keep the soil type that you have, like if you have a bunch of clay, just mix that compost right in, and you're going to have to pulverize it probably, you know, especially if it's heavy clay to be able to get that stuff to mix up. Um, but uh, I would say just use your existing soil with compost and I would avoid peat altogether because peat is, um, they're harvested from 
from old bogs. And compost is a much more um, sustainable material in that way because we we make it, we create it. It's from our waste, and uh, you know we can we can make our own. We don't have to carve up um, you know peat bogs for it. And a peat also has a really acidic um, pH, which can be really different than what your soils are also. So I'd say compost is your best friend with that. Susan, you have anything to add to that? Nope. You pretty much, yeah, it's much better to use a sustainable material than to destroy a natural area for your garden, yeah. Um, and what's the best oh. way to mix up um, that compost with my rain garden soils? Should I rototill or just use a shovel? I'd, I'd say see. first shovel, yeah. then rototill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it kind of depends on what your soil is. If you have massive clods of clay, you know, that's that's tricky. Um, but if it's pretty loose material, then you may just be able to rototill it all. But you can still, you don't have to rent a rototiller to do it. You really can just chop it up with a spade um, and then with a rake and things like that. So you just want to pulverize it, though. Not, um, it doesn't have to be itty-bitty, but you do want it to mix. Um, so I would just say that. All right, thank you so much, Katie. All right, so now actually Katie's going to stay on and um, talk about how another way that you can earn your Master Rain Gardener certification is to become a rain garden steward. And how does that work, Katie? All right, hi everybody. Um, so a big part of my job is to maintain the public rain gardens for the city of Ann Arbor, and I also work with schools all throughout Washtenaw County. Um, to build schoolyard rain gardens, and then I also will teach in the classroom um, about water quality and rain gardens. So if by now you've realized that a rain garden just isn't going to work on your own property, then there's another route that you can take to become a certified master rain gardener, and that is to adopt one of these public rain gardens. Um, so if you're not in Ann Arbor or even Washtenaw County, I'm sure that there is a public rain garden near you that needs to be adopted, and we're going to send out some resources to you on that. Um, but if you are in the county, and especially in Ann Arbor, then, um, then you'll work with me to adopt one of those locations. So what does a steward do? Um, well, just like what you would do in your own garden, you would be removing invasive weeds and any trash that might accumulate there. Um, I always send a monthly email that um, tells you what weeds to target during what time of the year, so don't, don't think that you have to know all of the invasives. You'll learn quickly. Um, and then something that's different than most gardens is you have to clear out the sediment that's coming into the rain garden. So you can see in that, um, that picture on the left side, that rocky inlet is from a parking lot, so that water flowing from the parking lot enters the rain garden and all the dirt and sediment is trapped in that inlet. So that has to be cleared out um, once, sometimes twice a year. Um, so that can be a big job. We also, in the fall and sometimes the early spring, will cut down all of the dead vegetation that has grown up to keep it nice and neat looking. We'll collect seeds in the fall, and then in the spring often we'll scatter them. Sometimes we do planting projects, especially for the newer rain gardens. You can see Susan there, that's along Madison Avenue in Ann Arbor. And um, then we also will do transplanting usually in the fall. Some other jobs um, for the more sciencey people out there, we do photo monitoring all through the seasons. So for the Ann Arbor locations, I've set up specific spots where we take photos from and that just helps us to see how the vegetation is changing and how the water levels are changing. So this is at Mary Beth Doyle Park in Ann Arbor, and even that bottom right picture of the fall, that's the same spot, it just is full of water after a big rainfall. Um, so after large rain events, usually more than a half an inch, I'll send out an email too to have all the stewards go out to their rain gardens and measure how much standing water they have. And then you'll go out a second time, maybe an hour or two later, or maybe the next day, depending on your site and you'll take a second measurement. So then we can see how fast the water is drawing down in your rain garden. And that helps us over time to see how um, functioning that rain garden is. 
Um, we also will do big work days. Usually we'll bring in kids or we'll invite the neighborhood um, to help with bigger projects in the gardens. So the stewards will help plan that, let me know what kind of jobs need to be done. And then the stewards also will help lead those work days if they're available. Um, and then the stewards also will report any issues or suggestions that you have and you report volunteer hours. So that's how I track um, all the volunteer work that's happening in the public rain gardens. So it's pretty simple to um, to adopt a garden. You just have to find one that um, fits with your location. So in Ann Arbor, you can see that map. Um, there's quite a few within the city limits, and then there's a few other public ones around the county. Um, and that is a picture of the Celine Public Library on the right. So we'll match you with a location. And then um, you just have to fill out a form and you send that to me and then we will set up a site visit and it might be at a school. Um, so these are all the school ones in Washtenaw County and schools are a little bit different because they're usually brand new. So if we plant in the spring, then we'll ask our volunteers to water all through the summer to keep those plants alive. That's just for the first summer. After that, the plants are fine. Um, and schools are a lot of fun because you'll get to work with the teachers that are involved and the students. Usually we plan one or two work days a year with a few classes to get the kids involved. Um, so you'll fill out this application if you're interested, and then we'll set up a site visit for whatever spot you're gonna work at. And then it's up to you to volunteer and report your hours and to stay in touch. Um, so some of my volunteers I talk to every week, um, some of them I just hear from a few times a year. It really is up to you how, how committed you want to be to the spot. So my contact information is at the bottom and Susan will also send out my contact information and a few other resources if you're outside of the county. So thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Yeah, because we have, um, there's Jamie McCarthy in Kalamazoo and Nicole DeMole and Grand Rapids. So there's other places where people might need. And also um, Jeff, Jeff um, Jeffries in Flint. And there's also a rain garden, a Hidden Lake Gardens that needs volunteers. So there's all sorts of other places where you can volunteer to take care of a rain garden in your, um, in your community. Thank you so much, Katie. Okay, so next up we have Pat Gomez Martz is going to talk to us about um, uh, the story of her rain garden, which um, I loved hearing about Pat's gar garden. And when I asked you, Pat, welcome. Um, when I asked you what the theme of your rain garden was, you said, people plan, God laughs. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, actually a lot of life is like that, but rain gardens are like that too. Definitely. Um, we started here uh, looking at most of the front yard on both sides of the driveway, but we decided on the spot, that narrow strip of land right in front of the house, because I have two rain gutters there that pour off and the one next to the driveway, the rain gutter next to the driveway, puts a big puddle at, on the sidewalk, which ices over in the winter. So that was my big goal, get rid of that darn puddle. Yeah, and that's right where you walk up to your front door, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And we have a stream of people up and down the street, so it's not good to have ice there. So... Um, I decided, well, this looks like a good spot to dig a hole, just a random spot sort of near the nanny berries and nice looking soil, terrific, perked in less than two hours. Ooh. So yeah, wonderful stuff. Right. So you knew this was going to work. I love how you measured your shovel. Then you, when you're digging, you know how far you've dug. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a lot of, I've done a lot of digging in the past and I really didn't want to go too far because, you know, enough is enough. Right. Um, and then you said the surprise, there was even a surprise with this, that you, when you dug your um, per percolation test, it was right where the rain garden was going to be. Right. But, what else, but then when you actually dug your rain garden, what did you find? Roots. Oh, yes. Lots of roots. Oodles of roots. Right, well, that's, right. that's the perk dripping out. So I dug it so I could reach the hose easily. 
So that was oh, a good yeah. spot. Yeah. Right. Um, but yes, when I started digging, I thought I was going to get done in a couple of afternoons. No, not right. so much. Right. Um, yes, roots. Oh, and then um, also, you told me that the the soil in that one hole was gorgeous, oh, beautiful topsoil. Absolutely yeah. lovely. Uh, everywhere else in the yard, uh, or actually, that patch of green right there, the middle yeah. section that I haven't dug, on the other side of that, it's very gravelly. Ah, um, yeah. On the near side, it's much more reasonable. So yes, but those roots, those roots were something else. And there is a tree that you can't see. It would probably be to the left of the letter S in your case. Yeah, there it is. Um, that beastly tree must be the source of the roots. But do the roots look like they're going there? No. 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 <laughs> the, the neighbors were just hugely entertained by these roots. <laughs> we're all speculating on what they were. So. Yeah. Well, and also, like, how did the roots even get to be that direction? Yeah, it's, it's a mystery. Just, just Nature's a mystery. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so. right. Entertaining. Um, so, right, that's right. So you um, planned your garden. You thought about what kind of plants you might like. Yeah. And uh, I thought you picked out some nice ones. Yeah, I wanted an alternate leaf dogwood. I, I really love that tree, and it is a floodplain tree, so I thought it would be worth worth a try. Um, couldn't get my hands on one, though, so yeah. I do not have one. I have a red bud. I like red buds, so that, you know, as, as compromises go, that's fine. Uh, the ferns worked out. The bluebells, I put in the bluebells and the irises and that eupatorium, which is the fuzzy stuff on the uh, on the far right. I didn't get any culver's root, uh, but I ended up I ended up transplanting a lot of stuff, and some stuff just moved in. I had geraniums that went over from my neighbor's garden. Say so they came over, jump ship. They really right. do jump ship. They catapult. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. and you even did some analysis. Like, you know, when are these plants going to be blooming? During what time of the year? You had a nice spreadsheet. And then here's your plan that you were, um, you can see that the house is up at the top and then the sidewalk is kind of, you know, two-thirds of the way down. And she was yeah. going to put the rain, the rain garden in between. So this is 10 feet away from the house, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, is. The 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 nodding onion, onions and the geraniums here are really very much the edge. So the hope was I'd have a rim that was planted with nice stuff that wasn't grass, and then I'd have the pool in the middle. Um, and it's more or less a pool in the middle of a lawn. Right, right. Well, it has this nice border. Actually, it makes it look... Um... It makes it look really nice. Uh, and then you started, so you dug it, and you started, you started hitting all these roots. And um, then you started planting. You had some of these um, wild ginger from the rest of your yard. You have a beautiful garden in the rest of your yard. And you had some right. extra wild ginger, so you put them in your rain garden last fall, right? Right. And when you have wild ginger, eventually you do have extra ginger, lots of it, because it's, it's a happy plant. So I moved some over here, figuring, well, it only gets morning sun, and that honey locust actually casts a fair amount of shade. Um, so it was okay last fall, but I planted the beginning of November. By April, it was cooked. There was yeah. no wild ginger left. It was just gone. Absolutely right. gone. Uh, it really just wants pure shade. Oh, that, it, yeah. It wants, it wants pure shade and it wants a reasonable, you know, wetness all the time. You know, it wants damp soil. I've been watering the wild ginger in the back this summer. It's needed water every two weeks or so. The, um, I just wanted to point that out because you are an expert gardener and you have beautiful gardens. Even the expert gardeners kill some plants. And I just want to, you know, for the new gardeners, don't worry if you kill a plant. It's okay. It's an no, the part secret, of gardening. The secret <laughs> to the success of gardening is having a compost pile because that's where you bury your mistakes. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. Well, anything that gets too wild or dies goes in the compost. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, this is uh, I. So I bought some plants through through the county office uh, in May, 
and I brought them home and put them in and you can see there's not a sign of ginger. This is so the one on the left shows I think it's May 22nd it's the day we picked up the plants. Um, everything's planted including the little tree and then the picture on the right was taken July 11th so they're very happy they're settled in and I've been giving this yard with the dry summer we're having I've been giving it a really thorough soaking every maybe five or six days not quite a week unless it rains so right and that's and, probably why it's doing so nicely and you have um you know, since you have sandy soils, well-draining soils, look at the growth that's happened. This is really because of the compost you put in and also because it's a rain garden. So it gets yeah. enough water. Yeah. It gets enough water. There's really quite a slope from the house and, and it all just drains down. The puddle is already gone. The puddle on the sidewalk when we had heavy rain, there was huh. no puddling there. there. There was a runoff from my neighbors, but no puddling there. Uh, so and I have not yet connected up the rain gutters. So. Yeah, yeah, they just they just run down the slope into the garden. Runs right, in, right. Yep, just straight down the slope. That's so, great. Yeah. And you were saying that there's um, black eyed, or brown eyed Susan in here, and that it's a beautiful. Plant. Yeah, and they are actually blooming. Uh, the rabbits ate a good chunk of one of the plants, but even that is recovering. So. Oh, that's good. And here it is full of water. You took this out of your window, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, the whole thing filled up. It was nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Had a river running down to the north towards the driveway. And that, that end is dug deeper. So it, it really gets nice and uh, got nice and wet. There was a good inch of water in there. Which drained out within an hour. I think it was gone. <laughs> that's that's the roots. Um, right. Yeah, the root the the garden layout that I have now has nothing to do with what I originally planned. Right. And, and the good thing about having a plan, though, is you know you have the right you have the right number of plants to fill the space. Right. Even if you don't end up putting them where you originally planned. So I worked around the roots. Uh, honey locust in particular has a real problem and it loves to sprout and I am yeah. rubbing those sprouts off every few days so wow yeah. so that's one thing about leaving the roots in is they, they they might sprout I think basswood and honey locust would do that most other trees probably wouldn't like an oak would never would no. never do that or no. Um, no. maple wouldn't do that yeah yeah so Keep that, yeah, in, keep is, that in mind. Um, you think they would end at the end of the crown, at the drip line. They don't. I've had honey locust sprouts come up halfway to the back of the house. And they're oh, my goodness. Them. Yeah, they're just they're terrible. If you nick that with a lawnmower, you will get a sprout. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They are. So here's the, when I visited you and I took this photo, um, the penstemon was blooming, and you're saying now that the brown-eyed Susan is blooming. What do you think about your rain garden? Overall. I am very pleased with it. It's it's really nice, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the spring. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yours is only one year old. It's baby. Yeah, it's it's a baby, and actually, a lot of those plants were just put in this May. Yeah, so right, right. It really right. is pretty new. Right, well, so. we can't wait to revisit it again. Maybe we'll revisit it last year, uh, next year, because last year you also <laughs> presented your plan. So we'll just yeah. you know keep coming back every year and see, <laughs> see how what happens. happens. Yeah. yeah. Well, See what happens. Yeah. Thank you, and I'm really I'm glad I took this class. It was a it was a wonderful experience. Well, I'm glad you did too. And thanks so much for coming back and uh, uh, sharing your lessons learned. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> bye bye, Pat. Bye. Okay. So um, now how? Okay. So you're gonna make a plan just like Pat did. How are you gonna do that? How are you gonna measure your yard and then make up put your plan on paper. Well, before we get to like a scaled plan, which we're going to get to, I li well, the way I like to start a, a garden plan is to take a photo of your yard from maybe a spot that you normally see your yard, like the patio or the front walk or something like that, and take a photo, print it out, and then just start drawing on it and start figuring out what kind of shape would, it, would be pretty. Um, what do you want to look at when you're looking at your yard? You can also do this with a computer and start sticking in plan ideas. Um, but our, the next step is to make a plan 
to scale. And that's what we're going to teach you to do now. So like Shannon mentioned before, it's to scale and that means that one box equals one foot and that makes a lot of other things easier while you're planning. So you'll use this plan to lay out your garden once you build it and then you will know how much mulch and compost to buy, how much black pipe to buy, to, to buy or if you're using PVC, how much PVC pipe to buy. There's the compost going in and the mulch. So you'll know how much you know, either if you don't if you don't do a plan, then you just keep going back and forth to the store. Um, but you also know how many plants to buy. Uh, this is a and um, plants we'll be talking about a lot more next week when we're going to focus the whole class on plants. So how do you put together this sort of map of your yard? If you'd rather read how to Put, do these directions. The directions are also in the course pack, but if you want to hear, then come along. So the first step is to create a base plan, and we're going to measure the space and put this plan on paper, and then you'll be able to draw your rain garden on that paper. So Shannon, what are the steps to putting together the base map of your yard? Alrighty, so this is uh, kind of a color-coded base map so you can get a sense of, of what's what here. and. Um, Susan, if you can go to the next slide, I'll show you kind of the step-by-step -step process. So Susan talked about one square equals one foot, and so you have to figure out if um, when you go get um, a graph paper, they'll be at a, a variety of scales. Some of the squares are big, some of the squares are teeny tiny, you need to figure out what works for your yard. So what you can do is go into the area where you're going to be working, where you think your rain garden is going to be, and just have a general sense of, you know, is it 50 feet? from the house, is it 20 feet from the house, and you want, you know, you want to um, kind of match your square distance up with that too, so that um, because the bigger the square is, the kind of easier it is to work with, so you don't need to get teeny tiny ones unless you, unless you absolutely have to. So um, kind of have a general sense of the distances that you're thinking of because you're going to need to measure this from wherever your water is coming from, so like the garage roof, the house roof, or something like that, so you need that structure in there as well. Alrighty, so um, the other piece is that we all learned about making maps that north has to be up. North does not have to be up in this drawing. Um, you just need to have some sense of sun and shade if it's going to be, uh, you know, what, what the, the sun is like. What is more important is that your grid aligns with the structure from which you will be measuring. So on the next slide you will see it is way easier to have north not be up and to have your grid aligned with your garage or your house or your fence or wherever you're measuring from than if it's tilted like this because then you can't, you can't count things up in the same easy way. So way better to have north off and it aligned with the structure that you're measuring from. Okay, the other thing is locating important things around you. So the house, um, you know, the driveway, the garage, sheds, things that will have an impact on your rain garden. You don't have to like drop your entire yard if, you know, your rain garden's in one corner of it. You don't need to do the opposite corner of it. But things that you think could influence it. Um, so again, in this plan, they're going to be measuring off from the house. So we wanted to be able to align it with that so the house goes in there. Also where your property lines are, things like that. So um, uh, you have trees, you have sidewalks, you have um, utilities, you have fences. So all these pieces that end up influencing where your rain garden goes should show up on your plan. Right. Now some of these things might be difficult to locate or e less easy. And um, for instance, uh, that tree is not really lined up with anything. So how to get that tree on your plan so it's to scale and it's in the right place. Well, here's a here's a way that you can do that. So first, um, on a separate piece of paper, just a plain piece of paper, draw a little sketch on your uh, of your yard. And so you know you have a tree, you have a house, and then go outside. And measure from the house is going to be sort of your starting spot. Measure from one corner of the house to that tree that you're trying to locate. And then measure from the other corner of the house to the tree and then measure between those two beginning spots, so along the side of the house. Basically, we're going to triangulate. And then when you take those measurements, write down on your piece of paper what those measurements were. So this is your taking notes outside. 
Then go inside to your more finished drawing that's on graph paper and draw in the house. In this case, the house was 14 feet long, so draw that line 14 feet, and that's uh, your starting points. Then from the first point that you measured from, uh, take a string and attach your pencil to it and s measure that string the same um, length as you, what you measured. So out in the real world, it was 46 feet long. So here on your map, make that string 46 boxes long and then put one end of the string at point number one and then draw a little arc uh, where approximately where the tree was because you don't know exactly where it is on this plan. And then do the same thing from the second point. In this case, it was 23 feet to that tree from the second point. Make, make your string 23 boxes long and then draw a little arc starting from point number two. And where those two arcs intersect, that's where the tree is on your plan. So it's kind of a triangulation, and you can use this method to locate anything that's in your yard, like two ends of a fence or um, any object out in the yard that you need to avoid, utilities, things like that, just by basing them on the corners of your house. So that's a method to use to start your um, your base map. What else? So uh, Helen, get, what else? What else should people yeah. include? So let's make sure that we're. Um, this will keep you honest about making it ten feet from the basement, right? <laughs> so you, right. you can count those boxes over and make sure that you're good to go with that. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing is that you should stay at least two feet away from your property line, the disturbance area. Don't just put your rain garden right on the edge and create your berm on the neighbors, right? So just yeah. be smart about that, right? Not a good neighborly thing to do. Um, the other thing is drawing in your conveyance path, like how are you getting the water there and where is it entering um, and you know where is your downspout and things like that. That's going to allow you to know how, how long that pipe needs to be when you show up at the hardware store to be able to buy it. Count those squares over. And then you need a safe place to overflow so you can put that on the plan too and make sure that, oh, I'm not going to be outletting it towards my window well or you know things like that. So um, again, just thinking through all these pieces, all the elements of the rain garden. And then you can make it kind of an interesting shape. I mean, the thing, um, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, a square or a rectangle because what you can do is make it some kind of fun shape, have it respond to the tree, um, and then you can just count up those squares and see, oh, I generally have about, you know, 50 square feet or something like that um, based on those squares so that you don't have to dip back into your uh, nightmares of calculus to figure out what that <laughs> shape area is um, because it's that no really calculus. Really yeah. There's no, no calculus. calculus no. That, mm -mm. That's right. That's right. right. <laughs> Just count the square. Yeah. And next week we'll go over other design principles to think about how to make it fun. Um, yeah. Now in this in this design, um, we did one where it was tracing the drip line of this beautiful oak tree. Um, so we worked around those tree roots that way. And you can see the plan here um, that shows uh, kind of how we did that. And this. I mean, wow, this garden has got to be eight or nine years old now, something like that, and it still looks great. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to uh, be a, a box. Right. And then you can, again, you can, you know, it's so what I'm saying, you can count up those squares and figure out how much you have and just generally know whether you're hitting your 20%, 30%, or whatever size, you know, you feel like you need it to be for your life. So. That's true. And once you know the how many squares are in your rain garden, so how many square feet, your rain garden is, you'll be able to calculate how much mul how much mulch you'll need, how much compost you'll need, and how many plants you'll need. And in our email reminders, I'll send you some calculators that uh, there's some online calculators to make some of those easy conversions. So once you know the square feet, it's easy to to, to calculate all those. Yeah, just um, plug amounts. in the numbers. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so um, we've gone over a lot. Uh, are there any questions, Katie? Yeah, so one question um, is how do I figure out, um, say I want to put a lot of plants all in one zone of my rain garden, how do I figure out how many plants are going to fit into that section? So we have a great list that we've developed over time that, I don't know, Susan, if you've sent that out yet or not. Um, not yet. That'll be this week. But yep. Yeah, yeah. And in the, one of the columns that describes each plant is, with, is the spacing. 
and you measure it from, they call it OC or on center, so from the center of one plant to the center of the next plant, and so it could be 12 inches on center, in which case you would be taking up one square with, you know, your circle of that plant and the next square with the circle of another plant, or it could be 18 inches on center, which means it's a foot and a half, so those squares can really help you figure out your spacing in that way as well. So um, look at the list. And, um, and, and if you want to use plants that aren't on that list, it's really easy to be able to look up on the internet, like type in whatever the plant is you want to use and just say spacing requirements and you'll come up with a bunch of information on that. So that grid can help you figure that stuff out too. It's, kind of, it's a nice tool in that way. Right, and when you're drawing in your plant, you can make that circle that diameter. Yeah. So then you know you're putting them in with the right spacing. Yeah. Okay, um, all right, all we have are plants of the week left. Uh, we are talking about plants for part shade today. So in a spot that gets about six hours of sun and the rest shade, so really half sun, half shade. Okay, so the first plant of the day is Canada anemone, anemone canadensis, and this is a plant that people either love or they hate. So um, this plant, and the reason is because this plant will spread and it will fill up the rain garden. It will trample other plants. Don't use this plant if you like space in between your groups of plants. If that's what you like, do not use this plant. If you don't have a lot of time for gardening, it's not your hobby, perhaps you have small children, this may be the plant for you because once it fills up a garden, there is no chance for a weed to grow. So it depends on your lifestyle, really, if you want to plant this plant. Um, this plant likes uh, moist, the moist areas of the garden, so the moist sides, the moist bottom, but maybe not the wettest part of the rain garden. Uh, and it's just, it's short, so it's very neat and tidy, short plant. It's about a foot and a half feet tall. It has a pretty white flower that blooms in the spring, and it creates a, just a really neat and tidy border. It's a native, it's a pure native of Michigan, um, but it spreads like crazy. So that's the first plant of the day. The second one is uh, swamp milkweed and this is another one that likes that moist bottom, moist sides and it will take quite a bit of wet actually. This is um, swamp milkweed Asclepius incarnata. There are several milkweeds. All of the milkweeds are a host plant for the monarch butterfly and the monarch butterfly needs all the help it can get these days. So if you'd like to help the monarch migration across our country and into Mexico, plant some milkweed. This is also a beautiful plant, um, not as aggressive as, say, common milkweed. This is a much more um, well-behaved plant. It's also pretty tall, so two and a half to three feet tall, and it's best if you pair it with something shorter that will, perhaps it could pop up through something that's basically a ground cover or something, put something shorter in front of it so that it doesn't look quite as gangly. Also swamp milk milkweed has these beautiful and fun seed heads that you might remember from your childhood that just puff up and float away. My son calls them wishes when they float away. They're just beautiful, beautiful um, little puffs that float away in the wind. So it's kind of a fairy tale plant as well. The third plant of the day is nodding wild onion, Allium cernuum, and it's this tiny plant. It's really only a foot tall, so plant it somewhere where, where you will see it up close. It has pale lavender flowers, and it really looks best, since it kind of looks like a grass, to pair it with something with big leaves. So um, a plant with big leaves or something with pink blooms, like phlox. I saw it recently paired with phlox, and it looks great. Um, it likes the moist parts of the rain garden, but it will also take dry, so it could even go on the berm. It's a little happier in the moist, but it will take quite a bit of dry. The fourth uh, rain garden plant of the day is black snake root. It used to be used to treat snake bites, apparently. Um, it has a bunch of common names, and it has one, two Latin names, which is confusing. So it's either Simicifuga racemosa or Actea racemosa, whichever one, if you're nouveau or if you're old school, depends on. And uh, this is a beautiful plant because it has sort of a fluffy leaf base, and then it has this stalk of flower that has this elephant trunk that's quite a bit taller. So that st flower stalk may be four feet tall, and the white flowers are really beautiful. It also has a bunch of cultivars, uh, and those cultivars are the names that are in quotation marks that have purple leaves. So if you're looking at your garden and you're thinking, ah, oh, just too much green, 
you can get a plant with purple leaves just for just for fun. We have one plant that's our experimental plant, and you might have noticed this plant at Leslie Kelman's garden on the field trip, wild senna, senna hevacarpa. It's kind of a big plant. It has a plume of yellow flowers. It's in the pea family, so it's kind of an interesting looking plant, and it does great in clay. So clay in the rain garden, clay outside the rain garden, but do people like it? That's really my question. <laughs> do you have to be you know, a super gardener to like it, or will the general people like it? And then our last shrub of the day is um, a shrub. It's an elderberry. So the native uh, um, elderberry, Sambucus racemosa, has edible berries that you can make um, wine out of, or syrup, or jam, or jelly, rather. And it's quite delicious. There's also this beautiful cultivar called lemony lace that's chartreuse, and it has these sort of feathery uh, leaves that's really, really beautiful. So this is something, um, a plant that will do well in the wet bottom, because I always see it growing in ditches alongside roads. Uh, it'll do well in the very wettest, and then also on the moist sides. So those are all plants that will do in part shade. Looking ahead, your homework is to create a base plan for your garden, and then draw a few shapes of rain gardens. You don't have to totally decide exactly how your rain garden will be shaped, but start playing around with some shapes. Uh, tell us what the plants of the day were in the quiz, and then think of two plants that you'd like to grow together. So think of some sort of plant combination that you want to play with. So for instance, blue lobelia and hot lips turtle head bloom at the same time, and so look kind of gorgeous together. Or perhaps that swamp milkweed plus say fox sedge because it's a lot shorter and swamp milkweed can make fox sedge look a lot prettier. Fox sedge can look swamp milkweed look a little more respectable. So <laughs> some kind of fun combination and you can might even have plants from your garden that you'd like to divide and then put some of them into your rain garden as well. So I'll send you an email with reminders about the homework, a link to the quiz. Good luck and have fun with all your measuring and drawing homework this week. That's the end of our presentation for class number three. Remember, there are two more. If you're at work, it's time to go back to work. But we'll stick around and answer questions. But if you need to go back to work, this is a good time to do it. Katie, what are some of the questions that have come up? All right, the first one is, um, should I be worried at all about water freezing in my pipe as it's going out to the rain garden, especially in the winter time? Yeah, I mean, if your pipe is at a decent pitch, then it'll probably be okay. Um, it also needs to be kind of freely flowing on the other side. Um, I've seen um, some rain gardens where people kind of just outlet them literally into the soil in front of it, and that I would feel like would probably stop up a pipe and make your pipe freeze. Um, but if it's freely flowing, then uh, and it, it's obviously going down, right, down the gutter, so it's flowing, you know, that way. And then making sure that it's pitched at a rate, especially in a really flat area, um, a quarter inch per foot. Every, every foot out, you go a quarter inch down. And if you do it that way, you're going to have freely flowing pipes and it should be fine. And making sure that the end isn't clogged with leaves and, you know, things like that. So um, things may freeze in the winter, but generally they'll, when they melt, they'll open up and things, you shouldn't get ice dams, you know, with that. What about if you have a pop-up drain? How can you stop the water um, from settling in that elbow? Yeah, that's the downside of the pop-up, and I know that Roger talked about opening up that hole a lot more and making really making sure, making it bigger and making sure that leaves don't cover it and things like that. So I think that there's more, um, with the pop-up, I think there's a little more babysitting involved, frankly, to be able to make sure everything is going to work well. And I know some people um, underneath that little elbow where that hole is, sometimes we'll put some pea stone or things like that so that it kind of flows freely out of that, but it's only as good as the area of the pea stone that you have. So if you have really, really heavy clay soils, you know, it's tricky. Um, so uh, I would say you just need to be more aware with a pop-up of making sure that you've got a big enough hole and that you're kind of keeping track of it in terms of anything blocking it, uh, blocking up that hole so that you don't get that freezing um, issue. Yeah, Roger Moon, when he showed us that pop-up, um, he, every once in a while, he'll walk by and he'll take off the lid of the pop-up and look in there and see if there's anything, you know, yep. like leaves blocking up that hole and he'll scoop them out and put that yep. top back in. It's pretty easy, but you do have to keep on top of yep. it. Yep. 
All right, the next question is, you talked about um, just planting a low area that already is accumulating water with rain garden plants. You don't have to dig at all except to get rid of the grass. But what if that area is ponding water at more than six inches? What would you recommend? How long does the water sit there? That would be my first question. Is it like a week or is it a couple of hours? Because those are really different situations to me in terms of how, what that soil is like. If it's seasonally high water, then um, then those are those are different plants to me than something that sticks around for you know six hours and then goes away. If it's seasonally high water in the spring, then it's the plants that will um, deal with spring flooding. So it's the red dogwoods of the world, it's the elderberries of the world, um, things that will handle that kind of late winter, early spring um, flooding condition. Um, iris is going to work in whatever condition you have because it's an amazing plant and will take pretty um, deep ponding, not a foot. You know, you, it's within reason, I would say. If you're, if you're beyond eight inches, you're starting to get pretty deep and you actually may need to fill. In fact, um, that shady garden that we saw last week, um, Somebody had a rain garden that was existing that was too deep. And so and what she learned in our class was that she needed to fill it up to make a condition that was better for the plants. And so if you're ponding really deep, you may want to actually fill it in the places where it's a little less deep and be able to either spread it out in other areas or just only let it get that deep and have the outlet so it's set you know, for that. Because if it gets really deep, then you're just going to have a hard time um, finding things that are going to grow there in the long haul. You'll notice in vernal ponds in the woods, there's not a lot of vegetation growing in those. There's not a lot of herbaceous vegetation, you know, that's growing in those in the rest of the summer. Um, so it's, you know, it's not, it's only for a few plants that will handle that. Now, if it's only ponding for six hours or something like that, then that's almost like any other, you know, it's the wet side of the rain garden stuff, like the irises and the swamp milkweeds and some of the sedges and things like that um, that will take it. But it's the wet side of those plants. You're not going to get away with penstemon. You know, you're not going to get away with, um, you know, black-eyed Susan. It's just not going to happen. It's too wet, too deep. Also, if you um, just think about before you start filling your wet spot, where is that water going to go? Right. Because it goes somewhere. Don't make it go back towards your house. That's right. And if does it naturally have an outlet? Does it fill up and then spill somewhere? Or is it just generally infiltrate over time? You know, so, um, but the other thing is, is that you could, by amending your soil and planting the right plants, you could allow that water to infiltrate better too. So if you add a bunch of compost, I know it's back work, <laughs> um, but uh, you may be able to help break that stuff up and make that soil a little lighter too. All right, I have another question. Um, do you know of any plants that are less susceptible or more susceptible to rabbits? Oh, God. Oh. The bane of my existence. Oh, my God. I've been so frustrated by the bunnies in my own yard. Um, what I would say is don't plant uh, purple cone flower because exactly. rabbits love, they love purple, purple, purple cone flower. Cone flower. Yeah. They also ate 11 out of my 12 prairie dock, too. Once the prairie dock gets big, they're totally fine, but they love, like, the first growth. In fact, it seems like that's kind of the case with some of them. It's like the springtime, fresh, new, green, butter, lettuce kind of texture they love. And then sometimes when it gets older, they won't go for it. So you might even consider, like, putting a little bunny fence around in the spring if you really want to get some things going. Um, wow, Susan, what else? Like, I, I've never seen them eat geranium. Um, um, flocks I've, they'll eat, wild flocks I've seen them eat. I have seen fight them eat this with just having so much vegetation that they could never eat it. <laughs> <laughs> you have a jungle, then it's not an issue, right? Right, that's like that. That's not everyone's fault. <laughs> right. um, they don't also, tend to eat the grass either as much. Yeah, that's true. And also, um, if you can protect them for just one year, yeah. then they'll get enough. You know, the plants will get enough root structure that even when the bunnies eat them, they'll just grow again yeah. later. And then the yeah. bunnies won't eat them the second time. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people that I've talked to are really mad because the bunnies just ate their plants. But then the next year, the plants come back. So keep that in mind. Don't get too yeah. discouraged. Right. But at the same time, you may need to protect those plants, like like you were saying. My 11 of the 12 prairie dock did not come back <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> oh, because they were just so all sad. 
little. So if I had fenced it off the first year, then I may have been able to get away with that. That's I've right. I have, I have big prairie dock and bunnies, and they don't right. eat them. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. I think I just needed to make it over the hump, right, at that first year. Um, all right, just one more question. Um, someone wants to know if it's okay to plant Reno Kings. Are you familiar with that plant? Reno Kings. How do you spell it? R-E-N-O Kings. Never heard of it. That sounds like I a... I haven't heard of it either. Is it a cultivar of something? It must be. If they can give us a little more... Um, I'm looking it up really fast on my phone to see if... You look that up. You know, uh, Katie had a couple of questions that came up during the class that I couldn't quite, you know, circle back and answer. So let me answer those. She was saying, um, remember that when you're digging, you get down to the bottom where you're, you're not going to dig anymore, but you're going to add back your topsoil and compost. And Katie reminded me that it's best to scour that soil. So take a rake or something so that you don't have like the shiny, perfectly smooth soil that then you're adding your topsoil on top of. It's best to scour that, like rough it up a little bit so that the two soils mix somewhat. So that was one thing. And then the second thing someone asked during class, I was going through the kind of quickly through the measuring process if you're trying to locate a tree in your yard and putting it, put it on your plan. And she said, wait, how did you get that 46 feet? What you do is you go out in the yard and you measure from one corner of the house to the tree and the other corner of the house to the tree. So then you're writing down those measurements, whatever those measurements are, not necessarily 46. Um, you write that on your plan or you write that on your little sketch and then make your string that many boxes long. And that's how you uh, um, get your measurement. So, so not, 46 is not a magic number. It's just whatever you measure the distance, that's the number of boxes that you make your string length. So we need a little more information on the Reno Kings thing. I came up with baseball teams. So <laughs> no, no, no plants when I put it in with plants. So if you have anything else on that plant, then um, I just, um, Email us. We'll uh, th then we'll we'll look it up for you. Or if you have a picture to that, that would help also. It sounds like a cultivar name though. So if you could get a little more information, then we could probably tell you. Well, you know, another thing that came up as well was um, at the field trip. There was uh, a couple of people who were so patient in trying to talk to me, and they had specific qu sites about questions about their site. And if you still have after posting on the Facebook group or uh, the House Garden Web forum you still have questions that you don't have answered, feel free to drop me an email and I'll try to answer them or I can always come, if you're in Washtenaw County, I can always come to your house and we can stand there in your yard and problem solve. Because sometimes the, um, some people's yards are more complicated and they, make, they take a fresh set of eyes. So don't be afraid to ask. But if you're having, if all your questions are answered and you're pretty confident, go for it. You do it yourself because I actually can't visit everyone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're, I empower you to visit, Build your rain garden. You're doing it right. <laughs> Is that all, Katie? Yep. That's all our questions? Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time today. And um, enjoy your week and enjoy your homework. We will see you next week. Uh, so next week is plants. So stick around for plants. It's to totally exciting. And we have lots of fun things to talk about plants. And uh, we'll just geek out on it. So enjoy that as well. So see you next week. Thank you, everyone. And have a good afternoon.